at one point in the uh, early 60s, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'll lead up to it very quickly. Okay, fine. Uh, I was playing and, and uh, I, I did a couple summers in the Catskills, playing in, the, in one of the show bands at the Catskills. That was an experience. And, and uh, uh, we got to play all these different acts every, every day. And... Uh, living in the Catskills for the whole summer. That was a kind of different thing, too. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, anyway, so I would play there uh, in the summer and then come back and there wasn't much going going on. Uh, and uh, Oh, and I spent a summer pl in Wildwood playing at Cozy Morley's. Uh, everybody know who Cozy Morley was? <laughs> well, the way it came in. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did a summer doing that. And it was like, you could get a summer gig, and then you come back, and it was the same thing. The, this club scene, of, uh, and and playing with like different little rock bands. They weren't what you would call rock bands in the sense that what you think of now. But it was just like assembling four guys to go out and play cover t versions of tunes and stuff like that, and occasional jazz gigs. And then I tried to to you know play as many different places as I could, like mostly for free, you know, like playing with rehearsal bands and stuff like that, just to keep it going. <clears throat> and then I joined Al Raymond's band. And Al Raymond was a popular band leader, and he managed to keep a big band working for many, many years. And uh, it wasn't a jazz band, but, there, but we did get to do some jazz. And he, he kind of gave me a free hand because you know we would play gigs and then we were playing music like Glenn Miller music, but we also played music of, that was currently popular and other big band kind of thing. And one of the guys in the band, uh, his name was Grant Whistler, was a very good arranger and he, he did a lot of Maynard Ferguson type charts. <clears throat> so Al would let me blow, you know, he would say like, oh, okay, like just play a tune or you know take a couple of choruses. So, it was better quality of music than what I had been playing in these bars and stuff, you know. And and I stayed with him for a while uh, doing that, and I was continued also to be playing with other bands. And uh, <clears throat> and then uh, eventually I got married, <clears throat> and so I needed to make more money, you know. Uh, and uh, Al got me into teaching, and he said. Uh, he said, well, I can get you into to teaching, giving lessons in schools. And, and uh, there was a place, a music store in town called Connex. And Connex ha had uh, uh, the uh, rental programs for a lot of schools in, in, the, uh, in the whole area. So they would rent their music, in, musical instruments to schools, <clears throat> but they would also supply teachers. So I called the guy, he said, Al told me, he said, you know, call this guy and tell him I recommended you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I called the guy and the, immediately, like the next day, he called me back and he said, go over to Cardinal Doherty. And Cardinal Doherty had, was in existence then because you had asked me about it before. And uh, and see the guy over there, and I walked in, and the guy said, "Okay." And he gave me three days teaching, three full days teaching. Well, it didn't pay that much, but it, it helped out, you know. And then the next thing I know, there was another school, then another school, and all of a sudden I was like teaching every day. And I had never really been a teacher. I had given one or two lessons uh, before and didn't really know how to do it. And so. Uh, and the next thing I know, I was, I was, I was teaching in all these different schools. Uh, and then eventually what happened was somebody asked me to teach a class at, at uh, Philadelphia uh, <coughs> College of Performing Arts, which is now University of the Arts. And the guy needed to have a sub for one day. He said, would you go in and teach my class? Uh, and I said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, well, just do anything, you know. <laughs> so I went in and and uh, the kids liked me. And they said, hey, so they had told the 
at other people, you know, hey, that guy who came in, he, he was pretty good. He played and he, and he wrote stuff on the board and all this. And so the next thing I know, I became a teacher there and I never, I, I didn't have any degree. I still don't. So eventually, <laughs> high school, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> eventually I, I, I taught at University of the Arts. I taught at Temple. I taught at Westchester University and Philadelphia Community College. And uh, even now I still teach at Temple and I teach, but I don't do it full time. I just I go in. A What's little. your method? What did you find that was really <coughs> successful with that? I just, I, I just, I, I think I said to one day to myself, I have to find out, you know, what, what I'm going to say to people, like when I give them a lesson. So uh, I, I went back in my memory and said, well, how did I learn this stuff? Most of it was, you know, like uh, finding out from somebody, hey, what was that chord? What did you do over here and this and that, you know. So, so I kind of developed a, a method on my own, which I'm not going to try to explain, but I mean, a lot of it is I improvise the lessons as just the way I would, you know. So, I mean, I, I used to go into the, uh, the classroom with an agenda, you know, and I would say, today I'm going to talk about this. And as soon as I would get there, somebody would say, oh, I wanted to ask you a question. And then that would be the whole class, you know. So I would just say, oh, yeah, well, you know, and, and I, I think I was pretty good at that, you know, being able to just nail it, it like that, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's just my teaching method is mostly just thinking about how did I learn this? Like if I took a certain tune, what did I do to learn that? I first studied the melody and then I studied the chord progression and I learned how to do this, but blah, 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 blah. And then I just try to do it and, and uh, pass that on to the, the students. And uh, apparently it's successful with some and not with others. Yeah. You know, it's just like anything else. There were a lot of places that would open up and then close. You know, it's just like that today, you know, places that have like recently, I, w I had a, 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 a jazz brunch gig for a while at this place out in 30th and Walnut. And that was a nice gig, and we, were, and we were just given a bunch of dates, and all of a sudden they said, that's it, we're not using music anymore, you know. So it was like that back then, too, but, you know, a place would open, and then, uh, and then it would close, you know. But, uh, uh, uh he, uh, well, the underground was one that that went for a little bit for a while, and uh, I mean, right now I can't think of there. How there were just along, a, uh, Columbia Avenue. Well, Columbia? again, that was before your time. No, it wasn't before my time, but it was mostly black yeah. bands that got That's what, that know, did that right, kind of thing. Okay. So they might have been benefited from people, you know, but. Like in the in the Northeast, they they didn't want to hear jazz, yeah. you know. I mean, they, you had black audiences that still liked jazz, you know, and so those guys were probably playing all the time. The white audiences were going over to the Red Hill Inn. Remember the Red, Red Hill, Hill Inn was a you know, great. Yeah, that was That's a the great place, place. My parents used to go to Billy Kretschmer's. Yeah, Did you ever that, play was that, was that was a trad. That was a more Dixon, trad. Dixon yeah, Atlanta, yeah, right? yeah. You didn't play there. Or... I did play there uh, a couple times, uh, uh, but uh, it was more tr tr like you say trad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there are other places. I, if I could stop and think think about it, you know, some places in New Jersey. I remember playing the Rocky Castellani's was a place down in Atlantic City. The Rocky Castellani had been a, a boxer. He was a middleweight boxer and he owned a, a place in, in AC mm -hmm. where that had jazz and we would go down. I remember playing there with Jimmy Amaday and Tommy Bryant, you know, Ray Bryant's mm -hmm. brother. He was a bass player. Mm -hmm. And there was like a lot of that, that stuff. Uh, Did Chubbies that, have jazz? Hmm? Remember Chubbies? In, Chubbies. On in, 130? Yeah. Did they have jazz there? I don't think so. No? They may have. I, I, I don't really... Okay remember whether they did or not but uh and then did you get to play like the play like palumbo's latin oh yeah Cino, yeah that kind of stuff i played all those places yeah, yeah. backing up some major singers i guess yeah right? i played with frank sinatra at at the latin casino the, on walnut or in jersey no in the one in new jersey, new jersey. Okay. 
And uh, I played with Michel Legrand. I had a featured spot in his show uh, playing one of his compositions that he had written for Stan Getz. And uh, so I did that for a week over in, uh, in Cherry Hill. And he just passed away yeah. a couple yeah, right. months ago. Or something. Yeah. But uh, played there in Palumbo's. They were all... Yeah, I actually enjoyed those gigs because you, uh, you, most of the acts that come in that had like good professional music. I also played at the Valley Forge Music Fair for five years uh, in the in the playing the acts that come through there. I played with Sinatra there too, uh, and Tony you know, Marcio or, uh, Marcio? Tony, yeah, Tony Marcio ran that. Had that he was the contractor. Yeah, right. yeah. It's a mass bomb guy. Yeah. <laughs> Did you go to Mass Bahamas? No, no, but we were just talking to uh, Sam Reed, and Sam and Tony went to school together. Right, and yeah. And Ted Curson, and then Sam, Sam you know, Tony yeah. Marcione became a big band leader. Now, Tony's son is a is well known trumpet player in New York. Uh, he's uh, one of the first call uh, trumpet players in New York. He played, you know, the show The Producers? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he played lead trumpet. On, and the story is that he actually memorized the, the entire book, like so he could play the the entire show without looking at the music. <laughs> uh, yeah, and plus he plays jazz and he he plays lead trumpet in Terrell Stafford's mm -hmm. uh, big band. You know, yeah, a very very extremely talented guy. Yeah. Well, I think it's mostly uh, that has been somebody who had studied with me and they were happy with the results. And so then they say, hey, I learned this from, you know, so then someone, oh, well, I'm going to go to him. You know, and, uh, and the thing about it, it working with one person and not another, I've had students who come to me and you give them a lesson and you think, well, I did the best I could and they never come back, you know. And you just think, well, wh why is that? And then uh, I, it used to really bother me. Uh, but people are different, you know. Some, some peop I've had people tell me, like, wow, I learned more in this one lesson than I did, like, in uh, the last six years or something like that. And then other people are just, it's, it's lost on them, and you're giving them the same stuff. I don't know why, you know. But they, I finally came to realize, well, this is what I have to offer. If it works, it does, and if it doesn't, there's nothing I can do about that because that's all I have, you know. Now, uh, when, did, when did you start writing music, your own music? <clears throat> uh, well, I, I mean, I started to learn to write uh, when, back in the early 60s, because uh, I, I, I felt like if, if I was going to be a musician, I should learn how to arrange to become an arranger. And from playing with a big band, you know, with Woody Herman's band, I never really knew how to do that. <clears throat> and I remember at one point when Woody's band, there was a young guy named Gordon Brisker who became a famous saxophone player, pretty famous. And uh, uh, he, w he was the same age. And he, we had a rehearsal, and he brought an arrangement in, and it was really good. And I thought, wow, that guy knows how to arrange, and I don't, I don't have the slightest idea how to do that. And it just bothered me, and I thought, I, I should know how to do that. And not, not every musician does. I mean, uh, Charlie Parker, as far as I know, never arranged for a big band. Neither did uh, Sonny Rollins or Stan Gesser. But for me, I just thought, like, well... I haven't proven myself in the way those guys have, so I have to have as many tools as I can. And that was one thing I just really wanted to learn how to do. So uh, uh, over the years, I've gone to different people for lessons. I went to Dennis Sandoli. I uh, uh, went to a guy named Frank Hunter. Uh, and, uh, and, and I read a lot of books and listened to records and tried to copy stuff. And, and but I, I consider myself an arranger, not a composer. And I would write tunes, but they're mostly like jazz tunes, stuff that instrumental, you know. I never thought that I could write uh, songs, like songs that people sing. 
Uh, and now, in the last 10 years, I've written a number of songs. And uh, uh, the way that came about was um, I met this person, her name is Melissa Gilstrap, and she sort of challenged me at one time, said, why don't you try to write a song? And I said, no, I don't, I don't do that, you know. <clears throat> so uh, this goes back about 10 years, 10 years ago. And so she would call me from time to time and say, uh, uh, where are you playing this week or something uh, over, over here? You know, uh, well, have you written any songs? And I said, no, I don't do that. Yeah. So one night I'm sitting at home and I can remember this pretty clearly. I got an idea for a tune and I I want to write that out. And I sat down and within 30 minutes I had a tune. I said, you know, this actually sounds like it could have words to it. You know, and it was this tune called Perhaps This Winter, winter Time. That, so I, I called Melissa. I said, you know, I, I, I took you up on your challenge. I wrote this tune, but I'm going to offer you a challenge. You put words to it. And she said, I don't write words to tunes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I knew that she had the ability to do this because I had seen some poetry that she had written. So she said, that's not the same thing. I said, just do it. Just try it. You know. So now she was on the other end of it. And she came back and would call me and say, I can't think of anything to do. I, I, just keep listening to the song. I had made a recording of it. And uh, uh, something will come to you, you know. Well, after about three weeks, she called me up and she said, you know, I think I have an idea for, for this song. So she had written these words and they were, turned out to be great. And I had Nancy Reed from the Poconos, uh, had worked with her a lot with Dave Lenhart's group. And so we put her on a, a CD and she sang it. In fact, I have those CDs with me. Uh, and since then, it's, there's, Denise King recorded it. Uh, uh, Mary Ellen Desmond, and uh, uh, I had the, there was a, a woman in Florida named Lee Ann Lyons. She she wanted to perform it. She did perform it at a concert that we did down in Boca Raton. So from then, since then, I've written several other tunes, and we collaborated. And Melissa writes the lyrics, and uh, one was. Uh, called One Falling Tree, which was number one on WRTI's Hot 11 countdown for for something like 13 or 15 weeks or something like that. So I don't take myself too seriously as a composer. I'm not one of those people who like sits down every day and says, well, let's see what kind of, you know, how I'm going to write a song. I, I kind of just write it. If I'm inspired, I'll write down the tune and... Uh, and then if it sounds like it could be, there could be words put to it, I'll give it to her. And, and then she doesn't always do it either. So there was one song that I wrote five years ago, and I gave it to her. And uh, so it was kind of forgotten. So recently I, I said, uh, she, uh, do you still have that tune? And, you know, and we looked at it, and I had to fix it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, so, so I think I'll change this, and I changed a couple of notes, a couple of chords. And uh, so she wrote some words to it. Now, we played it at the big band. So Joanna Pascal sang it. It's called a Walk It Out. And so it's on uh, Facebook right now and uh, the, with my big band playing it. And uh, we've got all this response, and people said, wow, what a great tune. You can see it now. It's on, on Facebook. So... You know, so I have like uh, maybe ten compositions now that I, I it's, it's late in my career, you know, but they're pretty good tunes. They're not. Uh, I'm not going to be rivaling Jerome Kern or anybody, but you know. How do you, it, how do you pick the tunes uh, that you're going to arrange for your big band? What tunes? Have you that's picked? just strictly as if I just get inspired by it. You know, like if, if I could be driving my car and think of like. Uh, of a tune and say, hey, you know, maybe I'll write a big band arrangement. And then I just, when I get around to it, I, I, and then I just do it, you know.